Manchester. And I was in Iraq for 11 months, from 2005 to 2006. I was 19. I grew up in California, in East LA. Uh, my Grammy raised me because my mom was a junkie and we were always being evicted. And we really loved each other. Maria Ben Pacasta! She was Mexican, but she looked white like me. We were so alike, we were like sisters. Then when I was 16, Grammy got cancer, and the day before my 17th birthday, she died. I mean, I knew that she was sick, but you just never really expect it, you know. My grandpa didn't really know what to do with me after that. Uh, he made me feel like he wasn't really my grandpa anymore. So I joined a graffiti crew, and I got kicked out of school, and then another. I was smoking a lot of weed, really messing up. My boyfriend lived across the street from my school, so I used to go and see him instead of going to class. But in the end, I got sick and tired of myself, and that's when I started thinking about the Army. There were recruiters in the school hallways all the time, so I went to see one. If you sign up with the National Guard, you won't have to serve outside the country. National, because that means in the country, right? You get 3,000 bucks just for enlisting. The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. And all I had to do was sign up for six years. I wanted to do something I was proud of. I, I imagined telling my grandchildren about something I'd done to protect the country. It was a year after 9-11. I think a lot of people felt that way. So I went to the recruiter and I said that I wanted to sign up. You're gonna have to get your mom to sign that because you're only 17. I hadn't seen my mom in months, but I called her and I told her, if you wanna join, forge my name, I don't care. So I forged your name, right there under the recruiter's nose. We do it all the time. Don't worry about it. Well, I got my $3,000, but it turns out it's spread out over four years. And they take the taxes out. The Army never paid for me to go to any college that I wanted to go to. And it turns out you can't sign up for six years. It's got to be eight. So I'm in until I'm like, 24, and I never got to travel anywhere. Well, apart from the war in Iraq, my whole time in Iraq is a daze. I worked nights, and we were shot at every night. Mortars were coming in, and mortars is death. And you know when they say that only men are allowed on the front line, that is the biggest crock of shit. I was a tank gunner. But when I say that I was in the war, nobody listens. Nobody believes that I was a soldier. And do you know why? Because I'm female. Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. When I was a freshman in high school, I vowed I'd never be in the army. I wanted to go to college, you know? But my parents are real religious. Clara, you don't need to go to college. You can do God's work better in the army. It's strange, because she and my dad went to college, but they told me I didn't need to go. I was working as a cook in Bible camp in the summers, and I saw how I could make kids happy doing that. So I thought maybe Mama was right. Maybe serving food in the army would give me a mission to spread the word of God. So she took me to the recruitment office. I was just 16 then. They gave me the test that shows what kind of jobs you can do in the military. My score suggested that I could be a nurse. I wasn't sure about that. All I'd ever wanted to be was a teacher. But then the recruiter started calling my home all the time. And one day this recruiter came to my house. He was three years older than me. A model, picture guy, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, so handsome in his uniform. He told me I could be a chaplain's assistant, and that appealed to me because it was religious. And he was one of those perfect guys, you know. So I joined the reserves. Mama signed the waiver because I wasn't 17 yet. It was 2004 by then, but Mama and me weren't worried about the war. We knew you could die just as easily crossing the street. It's all in God's plan when you die, whether you go to war or not. Name is Terrace, 
Sergeant DeWalt Johnson to you. I'm 37 years old, the mother of four kids, two boys, two girls. My home is in Georgia now, but I grew up in D.C. My life there was pretty drastic. My stepfather was a drunk, beat up on my mom all the time. Beat up on me and my brothers and sisters too, but he saved the worst of it for her. He hit her with a hammer, lacerated her legs, broke her skull. One time, he stabbed her 13 times with a long kitchen knife till it sank in so deep, he couldn't pull the knife out again. She only survived because she was so fat. <laughs> By the time I was 13, though, I learned to fight him back. Laid him out flat with a baseball bat once. It was, I've got to kill this guy or he's gonna kill my mom. As soon as I could, I moved out and started living with my boyfriend. He's my husband now, a gentleman and a sweetheart. I've known him since I was nine. By the time I was 19, we had two kids and I was working two jobs. One at McDonald's and the other selling tour tickets down at Union Station. One day this recruiter comes up to me. Have you ever thought about signing up? The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. I got interested because I'd always wanted to travel. So I joined the Army Reserves and that enabled me to get out of D.C. <laughs> D.C. is such a poison place to me. I mean, all you've got there is a bunch of drugs and killing. Three of my brothers were shot to death there for no reason. My son was shot in a drive-by in the feet when he was just five years old, playing in the yard. It's because of the military that my kids live the way they do now. We have a nice house, they go to good schools. So I liked being in the Army. Then they sent me to Iraq. I grew up in a small rural town in Wisconsin. It's only about 2,000 people, so pretty much everybody knows everybody. There were two types of people in my town, the people who left and the people who stayed. My way of getting out was to join the Army National Guard when I was 17. A lot of people from my high school were in the military, so it didn't seem like any big deal, but my parents weren't happy about it. I come from a very political household. My dad was an elected official and we're Democrats, so I had to really argue with them to get them to sign and let me join. Anna, we just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. But I was stubborn. I thought I wanted to give something back to society, do something for my country, but really, it was a rebellion. When I joined the military, I got an overwhelmingly good response from my community. If I went downtown or to the supermarket in my uniform, people were proud of me. It made me feel like I belonged. After all, it was pre-9-11. We all thought differently then. In August 2001, I shipped out to do my training at Fort Jackson, and zero date, the day you meet your drill instructor, turned out to be September 11. we just finished taking the oath when the sergeant said something about a plane hitting towers, but I couldn't really hear. The people were running to the barracks, getting hysterical. The sergeant was saying, We're going to war! We're, We're going, going to war! war! We're going to war! But I just thought it was part of the training. It took me a couple hours to realize it was real. After that, there were rumors that training would speed up and we'd be sent over. But it didn't happen. Training just went on as normal. We stuck bayonets into man-shaped targets, sang songs about blood and killing, and didn't bat an eye, because we were already desensitized. What makes the green grass grow? Blood, blood, fragment, blood! What makes the pretty flowers blue? Guts, guts, pretty grimy guts! The real reason somebody killed on the battlefield isn't because of those songs. It isn't because we stuck a bayonet into a dummy on the assault course either. It's because our best friend's sitting next to us in the cab, and we don't want him to die. My name is Miriam Ruffalo. I'm 27 and third generation Air Force. My grandfather and father were Air Force officers and all my life I wanted to be just like them. So I joined the Air Force Reserves at the <coughs> high school and put myself through school during my enlistment. I got married too and had a baby girl. My daughter was only two years old when I was deployed. That was March 2003, right as the US was going into Iraq. I had to leave her with my husband. We're divorced now. It was so hard to leave my little girl. I kept worrying about would she be fed right, would she be able to sleep okay. It really hurt to hear her little voice on the phone. Well, I was on active duty for a little over eight years in the Air Force. 
I was a public affairs specialist. That means combat correspondent and a photographer. I loved my job. I am Santiago Flores, 46 years old and retired after 22 years in the Army. I was a drill sergeant who taught other people how to be drill sergeants. So, I have a drill sergeant personality. I used to tell my soldiers, I don't give a damn if you don't like me. I am not here to be your friend. You have an idea? You think it'll work? I'm open to that. But you don't know Master Sergeant Flores! Yes, yes Sergeant! Sergeant! Joining the military is not unusual for Native Americans. It's our way of holding on to the idea of being a warrior, of being a, a provider and a protector. It's something we find great honor and pride in. And nowadays, it is hard to find things that bring honor to your family for Natives. Until I was 10, we never lived in one place long enough for me to finish out a grade of school. My dad kept moving to find one job or another, but also to run away from his drinking. You know, drinking is a problem for Native people. Well, it was no different for my family. Finally, he bought a house and we stayed put. My dad's a supervisor in a bakery, and my mom's a bank teller. They raised me in a little town in southern Wisconsin. I didn't have any direction after high school, so I joined the Army Military Police, became specialist Sylvia Gonzalez. I did it for the money, and the challenge, and the discipline. My parents didn't have any opinion on me enlisting. That's what I wanted to do, was fine with them. So mom signed the papers because I was only 17. And then 9 11 happened, and I was mobilized to Iraq. 11 made a lot of people proud of being in military, including me. I wasn't scared. I was glad that I was in an organization that was going to do something about this. I never really thought about the actual war at first. I figured it wasn't my place to get involved in something that I didn't know much about. The thing that worried me was that I was going to be away from home for a whole year. They gave me notice three weeks before I had to go. My parents don't deal with things emotionally, so I just figured out my stuff, and I left. When I was 13, my dad brings home this white guy to work from fixing cars, George. This was 1973, and George was just back from Vietnam. He had one leg shorter than the other, and he would spent a whole year in hospital with his wounds. And people said he'd raped girls in Vietnam. I didn't like him at all. But he started being nice to me, took me to a drive-in movie, gave me a joint to smoke and something to drink. Then he raped me, and I got pregnant from that rape. My dad was furious, thought it was all my fault, didn't care that I was only 13. So he makes me get in the car and we go looking for George. We find him pretty quick. Get in the fucking car, my dad said. He was six feet tall, people did what he said. So George gets in, dad drives us back to the house, sits us down at the kitchen table, pulls out a gun, sets it on the table in front of us, and he tells George, you have five minutes and two choices. Either marry my daughter or die. And all I could think was, if my dad shoots George, he's going to go to prison, and all of us are going to be without a dad, and my mom's going to be without a husband, and it'll all be my fault. So I told George, marry him. I really hated him. My other son is the product of that rape. I love him, but he knows a story, and he feels pretty ill. And he hates having an Indian mom because he sees no honor in that. For the next few years, I'm living with George. He is beating the crap out of me. And I'm turning to drink just like the rest of my family. Now when I'm 16, I get pregnant again. Birth control? Nobody told me about that. And I had so much trauma in my life, who would have thought about that anyway? Finally, at one point, I can't take it anymore. So I decide to kill George and dump him in Lake Tahoe. 
but he's such a big guy, I can't figure out how I'm going to get his body there. I'm going to have to put him on a boat alive and then kill him, and he's such a really strong guy. So I'm thinking, okay, that's not going to work. But by the time I'm 20, George has landed in jail again for attacking me, and I'm divorced at last. So there I am living in a one-bedroom, cockroach-infested apartment with two kids, and I'm on welfare. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? That's when I decide to join the army. if you are a girl in the military. A bitch, a hoe, or a duck. You are a bitch if you won't sleep with them, a hoe if you got even one boyfriend, and a dyke if they don't like you. So you can't win. In Iraq in the beginning, I was considered a hoe because I was nice to people. When I heard what people were saying about me, I became a bitch. I, I wasn't mean. I just had to change so that nobody thought I was being flirty. I changed the way that I walked and the way that I talked. Everything. Nobody over there really knew who I was because I was always putting on an act. And a lot of the men didn't want us there. One guy told me that the only reason they send female soldiers is to provide eye candy for the guys. To keep them sane. In Vietnam, they had prostitutes, but they don't have those in Iraq, so they have women soldiers instead. It was July 2003 by the time I got to Iraq. We were in Fab Spiker, which used to be an Iraqi airbase, and there were huge pictures of Saddam Hussein everywhere. It was spooky. Soldiers would pose next to them and take pictures like tourists. I was attached to an army engineering unit and our job was to build bases and roads, fix bridges. So we cleaned up the rubble and all kinds of disgusting stuff in the building so we could move in. Uh, excrement, rags, bits of military equipment. We prepared the base, built runways, used scrap metal to make our own armor because we had no up armored vehicles. We built a basketball court for ourselves. But we were doing nothing to help the Iraqi people. I was petroleum supply specialist. That means I pumped gas. My job was to drive around the base refueling dump trucks, rollers, scrapers, wait for a couple hours, then do it again. When it was busy, it was really busy. And when it was slow, there was absolutely nothing to do. So I wrote a lot of letters, took pictures, threw rocks into a box. My unit was a real good old boys club though. And I was one of only 19 women out of 141 people. The leadership didn't trust women to do a good job at anything. They were always hovering over you, waiting for you to screw up. Soon, you feel like you couldn't do anything right. And the guys had cases of porn, which they'd look at out in the open. They were always calling out things like, Hey, Peterford, I like your tits in that t-shirt. It happened so much, you got numb. Finally, after a couple months, I started to go out on missions to rebuild schools. That was the best part of my time there. Then, I began to convoy to other bases. I was driving a 2300 gallon diesel truck and because it was taking occasional gunfire, it could have burst into flames any moment. It was a bomb on wheels. The Iraqi people were pretty hostile to us by that time. When we went into a town, we were always looking at faces and hands, trying to guess their mood. If they're staring at you, not in fear, but because they hate you, well, you know you're not wanted. We were told the kids could be dangerous too. They could be a decoy or be carrying a bomb. So if they run in front of the convoy, you're supposed to run them over. I'd been a daycare teacher before I got deployed. And one of the guys on my team who knew this about me said, Ed and I have been talking. 
If a kid came in front of the convoy, we don't know if you'd be able to run him over. I had to tell him, I don't know if I could either. But then, our first day out, a boy threw a rock at our vehicle. It made a crack like a bullet. And I knew then that if I had to hit a kid and kill him, I would. Not to save my life, but to save all the soldiers who might die. That was really hard to come to terms with. You feel so dirty. By the time I was deployed to Iraq in 2005, I was 35 years old and I'd been in the army for 14 years. So when I was on the plane to Kuwait and all the young soldiers around me were making all kinds of dumbass jokes about going to Iraq, I gave them a piece of my mind. <laughs> hey, I don't know what this means to you, but to me this isn't a game. I have four kids at home who will have no understanding if I'm killed. Back when I was training at Fort Bragg, I knew things were going to get bad when I saw how my command was acting. Instead of the leadership saying, we need to work together to bring these soldiers back safe and sound. Too many people wanted to be chief, and not enough wanted to do the work. And they were training us like we were going to fight in a jungle, not the desert. They made us practice lying in the grass and taking cover behind jungle plants. There ain't no jungle in Iraq. Then I, I had this dream. I'm in a truck and it gets hit. The vehicle blows up and all I see is a, a big ball of fire above me. My sight goes black for a minute. When it comes back, I'm descending from the clouds to my mom's house. My mom is there and she is going berserk because the news has gotten to her that I got killed. And that's what hurt me the most. The next morning, they ordered me to the firing range to practice shooting with live rounds, but I couldn't shake that dream. I get my weapon, and when I look up, the first sergeant and the commander are there, and I'm thinking, these morons are going to get me killed. And all of a sudden, this anger just comes over me, and I can see myself shooting both those morons dead. Sergeant, I can't go to the range today. Somebody needs to take this weapon off of me, please. No, sir. And I throw my weapon and my Kevlar on the ground, and I walk off. And then I call my uncle, who's a bishop and I tell him about my dream. And he says it's a warning about my leaders being so weak. So I decide I've got to speak to them. So I go to the first sergeant. Sir, we've been here now for about four or five weeks and for some reason the senior enlisted still have not gotten it together. Now none of these soldiers are gonna tell you this to your face, but I will. We don't believe that you are able to lead a horse to water. Well, he didn't like that. He slapped me with an Article 15 for attempting to destroy government property. That was for throwing my M16 and my helmet on the ground. And then he tried to send me for a mental eval. Sir, I've been in the Army 14 years, sir, and I have never been sent for a mental eval. Just talk to me, sir, when there's a problem. I know when I get tense, my brows kind of frown up, but it really doesn't mean anything. I'm not as fierce as I look. So I thought that was the end of that. Two weeks later, we were deployed. When we flew into Kuwait, there was nothing to do for six weeks. I had my 20th birthday there. But otherwise, we just sat around, played cards. And then finally, in June 03, we convoyed to Baghdad to Camp Mustang in the Green Zone. Our mission was to reinstall the police force, guard it from the looters, fix it up, weed out the good police from the bad. Some were taking bribes, beating, raping the prisoners. We weren't going to allow them to do that anymore. Some were part of the insurgency. We figured it out. Later, we made it to this other base where we were sleeping in tents with sandbags around them. We didn't have any protection from water there. This tent just down the road from us got hit. It was shredded. My friend Sandra had just left a latrine when, she, when it got mortared, and she turned around. It was gone. My first five months, the routine was the same every day. 
you uh, load the trucks with equipment, go through inspections, meet with the squad about what we were going to do, and then I'd have breakfast and I'd climb into a Humvee with the two guys that made up my team and we'd convoy through Baghdad to a police station. And then 12 hours later, the next squad comes, relieves you, you load up, go home, put everything away, go to sleep, and do it all over again the next day. Being the only, well, the youngest uh, soldier in my team, I was the gunner. That meant that when we were driving, I was sitting, sticking out of the rooftop of the Humvee with my 50 cal machine gun in this little gun turret. Now in the gun turret, you're exposed from name tag up. We didn't have any shields. Luckily in the beginning, we mostly got waves and good feedback. We had like 20 kids that would always follow us and dance for us. Some of the women would run away. But later people got hostile. People stare at you, give you dirty looks, give you a finger. Some tell you to go home, throw a rock at you. And guys expose themselves because you're a female. Now, as a soldier, hostility doesn't bother me. But as a woman, it bothers me a lot. I hate it when guys do that. I think it's sick and disgusting, Iraqi or not. And our own soldiers were a problem, too. They make flirty or sexual comments, stare at you. That was something that I couldn't stand. You walk into the chow hall, there's a bunch of guys that just stop eating and stare at you. Every time you bend over, somebody's gonna say something. It got to the point with me where, well, I was afraid of walking past certain people because I didn't want to hear their comments. It just really wears you down. I said I loved my job, and I did, but right from my time at boot camp up until I got out, I was harassed all the time. People used to call me Air Force Barbie. Couldn't go anywhere without being watched by a million eyes. I had a senior non-commissioned officer constantly quiz me about my sex life, show up at my barracks at odd hours of the night, and ask me personal questions that no supervisor should ever have the right to ask. I had a colonel sexually harass me in ways I'm too embarrassed to explain. These are the people who had complete control over my life. When I worked, when I ate, when I slept, when I could talk or not talk, rest or not rest. These are the people who I was supposed to obey no matter what. One time my sergeant came sit with me in the chow hall and said, <clears throat> feel like I'm in a fishbowl the way all these men's eyes are boring into your back. That's what my life is like, I said. Well, finally, I went to my leadership and explained the situation. I was told to write an MFR, a memo for record, every time that officer said or did anything that made me feel uncomfortable. Well, I did that for months until I had a binder just full of those memos. I took it straight to senior leadership. Did that officer get punished? No. He went on to make E9, which is the highest enlisted rank in the armed forces. Why am I complaining? It was only words and gestures, right? But it should never have happened. I was a hard worker who loved her country and service. This is not what I deserved. But like so many other females <laughs> in the military, I put up with it for the good of my family, my beliefs, and my country. Well, after my first deployment, I decided the constant harassment was all just a part of being a female in the military. And I made the decision not to tell anyone anymore about my problems. Excuse my language, but I decided to be a bitch. Bitch! <clears throat> when I first got to Iraq in November 2005, I was still hoping to do God's work among my fellow soldiers. I was there for a year, and in the beginning I was attached to a company out of Alaska. My platoon had 60 men and one lone female, me. I was also the youngest, still 17. Because I was the only female there, men would forget in front of me all the time and say these terrible derogatory things about women. I had to hear these things every day. I'd have to say, hey! And then they'd look at me all surprised and say, oh, we don't mean you. One of the guys I thought was my friend tried to rape me. Two of my sergeants wouldn't stop making passes at me. Everybody's supposed to have a battle buddy in the army. Females are supposed to have one to go to the latrines with or the showers. That's so you don't get raped by the men on your own side. But because I was the only female there, I didn't have a battle buddy. 
My battle buddy was my gun and my knife. When we drove up into Iraq on a convoy in April, we saw how the people there were living. It was so sad. We saw kids on the sides of roads using hand signals to beg for food and water. Kids, barefoot and dirty. We saw how they live in makeshift mud houses held together with pieces of clothing or plastic. It makes us realize how blessed we are. Seeing those kids, though, made me miss my own kids real bad. My youngest, now, he don't beat around the bush. On Mother's Day, he sent me an email that said, Mommy, happy Mother's Day. Love you. Wish you were here. Hope you don't get killed in Iraq. Okay, bye. We were based at Camp Adder in the south, but it wasn't long before they sent me to Camp Anaconda, which is 50 miles north of Baghdad. <laughs> Anaconda got mortared so much, the soldiers called it Mortaritaville. But our trucks had no armor, nothing, and we weren't even authorized to be out on that road, but they sent us out anyway, and at night, too. <laughs> it was a suicide mission. I'm driving the middle gun truck when an IED goes off right under the truck in front of me. It was so loud, it scared the living shit out of me. My heart was pumping so fast, it felt like it was gonna jump right out of my chest. But I showed none of what I was feeling to my soldiers. Two days later, the commanders ordered us out into formation. I expected some kind of uh, apology, but they were blabbering on about nothing. Setting up the internet, uh, how we're violating dress codes by wearing the wrong t-shirts for PT. Dude, I've been fired at. I don't want to hear about no goddamn t-shirt. Then they asked, anybody got anything to say? Nobody said anything. <laughs> but these soldiers were young and trained not to question their seniors. So I raised my hand. First sergeant, did you all forget about the incident two days ago? <laughs> Do you realize that none of your soldiers have any confidence in the leadership now? Don't you give a damn about us? First Sergeant gives me this look like he wants to kill me, but he don't say nothing. <laughs> See, when you have a female with that type of attitude in the military, it doesn't go over well with a lot of men. I was deployed to Iraq in 2004 when I was 42 years old and a staff sergeant with 19 years of service under my belt. I was so proud of what I'd done in the military that when my two sons grew up, I encouraged them to join too. One's in the Army, the other's the Marine. And by the time I got sent to Iraq, they came with seven grandchildren. I was based at Camp Cedar II, a convoy pit stop about 185 miles southeast of Baghdad. I was put to work with a lieutenant in charge of organizing the movement and repairs of all the vehicles. They were so messed up, they knew how they <coughs> soldiers they had. You could be missing for a week and nobody would know. So I thought, okay, they don't know where they're doing any better than I do. And I started organizing the whole thing myself. But we were under command of this female major, a white woman who hated anyone who wasn't white and male. She replaced every soldier of color with a white soldier and she made the soldiers of color train the white people who would take over their jobs. She destroyed the careers of many soldiers of color doing that. But if you said anything, you'd be punished. One of the first things she did when we got to Iraq was she made me and the other female non-commissioned officers move into the same tents as the privates. We literally had that much space between our bunks. Now, you do not move a higher ranking soldier in with a lower ranking. It makes you lose your power base, because it's their territory. The major knew this. That's why she did it. Soon, the privates were refusing to obey our orders. This one girl, Benson, she had a canopy over her bed with pink blankets, and I thought, what the fuck? But when I tell her to move her bed over a foot to make room for me, she goes into this itty-bitty little voice like a baby. I don't care what you say. I'm not moving, Sergeant Flores. <laughs> but I got worried about what my young soldiers were going through out there on the roads in Iraq. 
One was this young female sergeant who trained as a driver, but they made her into a gunner because there was a shortage of military police to do the job. That's how a lot of women end up in combat in this war. Well, she and her team are out on the road one day, and they were attacked with mortars and grenades. So the sergeant fires back with her machine gun. And she kills a bunch of civilians. So when she gets back, she's all excited, shouting about what happened. Calm it down! Right now, your adrenaline's up. Tomorrow's going to be a different story. Then I realized the combat stress team hasn't shown up. Now, they're supposed to come help soldiers who've been in battle like this. But nobody bothered to come. Go to bed. It'll be fine. But I know it won't. Sure enough, the next morning, this sergeant and her team are a mess. One's lying in her bunk in a fetal position, and the others are sobbing because, well, they've killed all these innocent people. And Benson, the girl with the pink blankets? Well, she was driving a large truck in a convoy. Now, over there, you drive on the opposite side of the road a lot to avoid IEDs, and you drive fast. Well, this car was coming towards them, but nobody had time to get out of the way. So the car ends up driving right underneath the truck. Killed four children, both the parents. There was blood and body parts all over the place. So when she gets back to camp, she's in shock. I guess she thought I was still mad at her because she just stood there and didn't say anything. So I hugged her. She started crying. She was only 20 years old. They should have debriefed these girls. They should have had a combat stress person there, but they didn't. Nobody was taking care of these kids, so you can imagine the condition they were in when they got back home. And I know it's not getting any better. In October 03, I was sent up to Bakaba, just northeast of Baghdad. We stayed in Camp Warhorse. One night, we were in the wreck building. I was doing my email when the whole building shook. There was this high-pitched squealing sound and a flash, and it went black. Everybody stared at each other a second, then dropped to the ground! <laughs> Twenty seconds later, another bomb dropped. I grabbed somebody's shirt. Take me to the bunker. We got outside. There was no bunker. Another mortar dropped 50 meters away. Shrapnel was flying over our heads. This girl was lying on the ground screaming. My bone's coming out of my arm. My bone's coming out of my arm. Someone inside the building was calling. Medic! Medic! I ran back inside. I saw four bodies on the ground. Two Iraqi workers and two American soldiers. I started working on them. It was dark in there, and all I had was this tiny blue flashlight to see. Blood was all over the place. This female was lying on the ground, covered in it, and this guy called Sergeant Hill was helping her. I said, is this blood all hers? Is an artery hit? He said, no, I think some of it's mine. I got hit too, but she's worse. I found someone else to help her, and then I lifted his arm, and there was all this blood. He was much worse than her, but he didn't realize because he was in shock. But we packed all the wounded into the Humvee. I was holding back this guy's blood with my hand. I didn't have anything else. Another mortar dropped. We had no flat jackets, no Kevlars, nothing. So we threw our bodies on top of the patients. The mortar stopped long enough for us to drive the wounded to the hospital. As soon as I got there, I saw a nurse and yelled, This is Sergeant Hill. He's 32. He's O positive. He needs blood now. How do you know? Because... I'm covered in blood, and none of it's mine. The only thing that helped me survive my time in Iraq was my boyfriend, Stephen. I could not have got through it without him. We met the night that I arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey for my AIT. We started talking immediately. He said, Give me your number. And then later he texts me saying, what's good? We started going out right away. Steven's black, but he looks kind of Dominican. Real cute, six foot, big muscular guy from New York. Now you're not allowed to fraternize in the army, which means have a relationship, but everybody did. And because he was a surgeon and I was a specialist, 
Nobody could know about us, but everybody knew. And then I got pregnant by him. So I couldn't deploy when he did and the rest of my team did. I had to stay behind at Fort Dix with strangers. Then after three months, I had a miscarriage. It made me feel really empty and sad. I really, really love Stephen, and I really wanted to have his baby. But they gave me one month to recover, and then they said, you're going to Iraq, which made me really mad, because one month is not enough time to get over losing a baby. But in February 05, I was sent to Fob Spiker. <laughs> they put me in this, uh, this chew, which is this tiny trailer that uh, sleeps two people, but you gotta share it with three. The night I arrived, it was so tight, I had to squeeze my way into it. I didn't end up getting along with the girl on my right. But the girl on my left, she was my friend from before. She was really excited to see me because the last she'd heard, I was pregnant. So, the first thing I did was I put on my favorite perfume and I went to look for Steven. We hadn't seen each other for four months. He knew that I was coming, but he didn't know when. So, I knocked on his door and his roomie said that he didn't know where he was. And then I remembered the time difference, that when it was midnight for him, it was three o'clock for me. And that's when we would talk online. So I thought, I know where he is. So I ran over to the recreational building, and sure enough, there he was, sitting at a corner computer with his back to me. Now, I didn't go up to him right away. Instead, I sat at a computer, and I logged online. Sure enough, there he was. I wrote, I'm in Kuwait. It's really cool that I'm in your time zone. And then he wrote, it's weird. I can smell you. I must really miss you because I can smell your perfume. So then I wrote, turn around. And he turned around and he just started laughing. In each police station that we would fix up in Baghdad, we'd go through the day searching people coming into the station, and switching guard positions. I searched mostly women, because guys were not allowed to do that in Iraq. Um, and you'd be there for like 12 hours every day, standing or sitting. It's hot. You can't move. And you have to watch everybody all the time. But you get used to that. Um, the thing that I couldn't stand was the people that I was working with. My squad leader was a pervert. He was old, like, 35 or 40. He used to point out these little Iraqi girls and say these disgusting sexual things about them all the time. <laughs> these girls are like 12 or 13 years old. But the worst was my team leader. He made passes at me at first. He stopped. But then he tried to have revenge by controlling everything that I did. I had to eat with him, because he wouldn't let me eat with my friends. I had to clean my weapon with him. He wouldn't let me talk to anybody. So I'd sit up in my Humvee turret all day long just to get away from him. Every day, alone. And people knew it, because they'd come up to me and say, Man, your life sucks! <laughs> when I asked to get switched, they wouldn't do it. And that just really made me hate my time there, because it got to a point where I didn't trust anybody that was in my company after a while. I didn't trust anybody at all. In fact, I still don't. During my first few months in Iraq, my sergeant assaulted and harassed me so often that I couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to report him. But when I turned him in... The one common factor in all these problems is you. Don't see this as a punishment, but we're going to have you transferred. Then that same sergeant got promoted right away. I didn't get my promotion for six months. They transferred me from Mosul to Rawa. Rawa was nothing but a tank camp on the Syrian border covered in sand. The camp had Marines, Navy, Air Force, and Army. There were over 1,500 men in the camp and less than 18 women, so it wasn't any better than the first platoon I was in. I was fresh meat to the hungry men there. I was less scared of the mortar rounds that came in every day than I was of the men who shared my food. I would never drink 
late in the day, even though it was so hot. Because the Porta Johns was so far away, it was dangerous. So I'd go for 16 hours in 140 degree heat and not drink. I just ate Skittles to keep my mouth from being too dry. I collapse from dehydration so often, I have IV track lines from all the times they had to rehydrate me. They made me cook because I'm female. Though I wanted to do other jobs too. So I was cooking 1,500 meals three times a day. I worked from four in the morning till nine at night the next day. I was exhausted all the time. One day, somebody wrote my name on a porter john saying I'd had sex with a lot of people. Only they put it in much worse words than that. But when I wasn't working, I went to chapel and then I went to bed. And that was all I did. Work, chapel, bed. Work, chapel, bed. It was, it was so untrue, but I couldn't prove it. I couldn't defend myself. Nobody there wanted to believe me. Nobody was on my side. I always tried to stay cheerful, be nice to everyone. Back in boot camp, I was known as Sunshine. But within a few months, I went from cheerful and smiling to bursting into tears all the time. I couldn't even smile anymore. I called Mama, crying, and told her what they were doing to me. If you were treading the path of righteousness, none of this would be happening. When I was working the entrance to Spiker, uh, we saw convoys being hit all the time. Highway 1 ran right past our base. We called it the Highway of Death because so many people got killed there by IEDs and mortars. One night, this convoy got hit, and it was like this huge flash in the night. And then they drove to us with their wounded. This civilian got out of his car and started throwing up because his brother, who sat next to him in the car, had been shot in the throat. I was on a tank out in the road just looking at him. I would radio for an ambulance, but they have to go through all this clearance and shit, so by the time it arrived, it was too late. The guy was already dead. I never really thought about death that much when I was in Iraq. I figure everything happens for a reason, and I'm going to die sometime. So I was never really afraid of dying. What I was afraid of, though, was uh, losing a limb, or scarring my face, or tripping. Because walking is really hard. It's hot, and you got all this heavy equipment, which weighs nearly half your weight if you're small, like me. And I was worried about our equipment, too. We had these flat jackets from Vietnam, which everybody said were no good against AK-47s, which is what the Iraqis are shooting. Our radios were old and broken. Our ambulances rattled and shook. I cannot imagine having to travel in one of those wounded. But I, I didn't mind working the checkpoint most of the time. I got to work with Steve in that way, because he was the team leader. And the sunrises and sunsets were beautiful. And I got along with the guys on my team most of the time. A couple of things they did bothered me, though. Steven went home for two weeks on R&R, &R, and they hit on me all the time. And then when he got back, they made up all these stories about me, hoping that we would break up and they would get a chance with me. Oh, and if we were attacked, they'd make me stay at the back of the tank. And they'd be like, oh, it's because you're like a little sister. We don't want anything to happen to you. And I'd be like, no! Don't look at me like I'm your little sister. I am a soldier, not a gender. I'm a soldier just like you. Wow. Then they took it to the next level. Uh, we had to guard out in the road, and uh, nobody wants to guard out in the road. The soldier that's out in the road is known as the sacrifice soldier because you are the first to be hit if anything happens. For a while, they put me out there every night. They did not want to hear me say, I'm a soldier. I am a soldier, just like you, and you, and you. My second deployment was to Afghanistan. 
in 2006 with the Army 10th Mountain Division. Now by this time I'm a sergeant with years of sexual harassment under my belt. So I decided this time it was going to be different. This time I decided to put up a wall. Now my wall became thicker and thicker. You know, normally I'm a very bubbly person, but all that disappeared behind the wall. And to this day, I don't know if I've ever regained that part of myself. But you have to put up a front and act like one of the boys. Even if it means losing who you are, you become very cold. You don't show your emotions. You don't let anyone in, because if you do, they will walk all over you. Still, the harassment was worse than it had ever been. A few months into my deployment, I was directed to full night guard duty. Now, I smoked like a chimney when I was in Afghanistan, and this night was no exception. So after a few hours, I put my weapon and my radio in the guard shack and walked 20 feet to the closest smoke deck. You don't ever leave your weapon unattended when you're in a combat zone. I had a momentary lapse. Thought I would be okay 20 feet from my weapon. I was wrong. I'd just taken a few drags of my cigarette when somebody grabbed me in a chokehold and dragged me behind some power generators. All I could see was a man much larger than me in a U.S. Armed Forces uniform. I struggled with all my strength to get free while he dragged me to this spot. I tried my hardest to fight him off man. I got in a few kicks, but it wasn't. finished his deep and left. Well, I waited until my shift was over and then did what every law and order show says to. Don't take a shower, go straight to the authorities. I thought they would listen to me. I was wrong. They told me if I filed a claim that I'd been raped, I'd also be charged with dereliction of duty for leaving my weapon unattended in a combat zone. That could get me court-martialed. Could end my career. So I shut up. Shut, shut up. up! Didn't say anything to anyone. Soon after I got to Iraq, they made me convoy commander. Now, some of those convoys are 25 trucks long, and I was in charge of making sure that every one of those soldiers and drivers did the mission and got back in one piece. One time, I'm in the lead gun truck going through a crowded street with this young guy up in the gunner's shoe. <clears throat> now, he hasn't been out on the road before. He's been in the office doing paperwork for so long, he was getting called Professor Stapler. Now, we got traffic coming at us and civilians all over the place, and this car comes toward us too close for comfort. But being that it's my gunner's first time, he doesn't know what to do. So I tell him, fire a warning shot. He doesn't shoot. So I tap him, hey man, don't be afraid to fucking shoot that weapon, okay? You do know how to shoot, right? The vehicle's getting closer and closer, but the moron still doesn't shoot, so I hit him. Man, I tell you to fucking fire! You fucking fire, you hear me? You don't never let a vehicle get close to my fucking convoy! He knows I'm not playing now. So he fires directly at the car. The hood peels right up, the whole car goes womp, 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 rolls over on its side, and then tumbles over this bank. My gunner panics, he's only 19. He grabs his head and he yells, oh my God, I think I killed somebody. Look, it's not your fault. I don't think you shot nobody, but we still got shit coming at us, you hear me? So I need you to focus right now and pay attention. But his face is red and he's yelling, oh my God. But when we get back after that, he has got a story to tell the guys. That makes him feel like he's matured from a boy to a man. See, a a lot of young soldiers feel like that. Women, too. They think, I'm not some wimpy female because of a job I did in Iraq. The longer we were in Iraq, the worse it got. It got so that you knew something was going to happen every day. You just didn't know what. One day we were driving to this police station in Najif when suddenly this IED blew up right next to my Humvee truck. And I must have passed out because when I woke up, I was by myself in the truck and uh, my ears were ringing and my whole body hurt. They gave me first aid. 
had an IV and some field dressing. I had shrapnel. That's little bits of metal in my arms and in my face. And my eardrums were ruptured. They took me to the hospital and uh, they cleaned me up, and gave me some painkillers, but I couldn't work for a month because I was deaf. So I just hung out on base, watched a lot of movies, slept. My body hurts so bad. But I wasn't phased to be wounded like that. I was like, okay, I'm alive. In fact, I was kind of pissed that I didn't get hurt worse. I really hated it out there. My friend, Michelle Whitmer, she was in our platoon. Um, she got shot too in an ambush, shot in the armpit. It hit her artery. She was 20 years old. She died instantly. My tour in Iraq was a real eye opener for me. Because my biggest enemy out there was my own company. Officers would brief us by saying, it's Indian country out there, go get them. I found that very shocking. If this is Indian country, perhaps I'm on the wrong side. But when I was over there, a lot of young people would come and ask me for help, especially soldiers of color. And I would stand up for them against their command. After all, I was old enough to be their mom. But that got me into a lot of trouble with my command. I was banned from my unit. I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. And then they sent me to another base, Camp Scania. That's where they send soldiers to punish them because Scania is on a major highway. It gets mortared all the time. The whole time I was at Scania, Hardly ever wrote home, even to my sons. I didn't even think about home. It's because you become hollow, like a robot. You get up, you do your job, you hear people complain, you talk about this, you talk about that, but you don't look inside. My sister sent me a medicine box with my prayer stuff in it, so I sit at night, smoke a cigarette and offer my prayers, and I watch the moon. That brought me some peace. That and the songs I would hear the Iraqi men singing in the morning at Camp Scania, the prayer songs, the songs would echo and, oh my God, it was beautiful, like angels. I'd wake up peaceful because of those songs. I think they saved me from myself because there were times I thought I was going insane. What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I not just getting on a plane and going home? What am I doing on this base? It's a, it's a concentration camp. That's when I started talking to the Iraqis who worked on the base. <laughs> the young ones would come up to me and say, you're Indian from India? And I would say, no! And then finally, one of them comes back after seeing the movie Dances with Wolves, and he goes, mm -hmm. you're Red Indian. And I said, yes, I'm a Red Indian. And he goes, Native American? And I'm like, yes. So I was invited to have a meal with them at the market they had just outside the base. They cook the same kind of rice my people cook. The same kind of bread and chicken. I tell them, we make this kind of bread. Tell me about your people and your religion. I want to know about your women. I want to know what you think about this war. I found out so many of their traditions are the same as mine. The significance of the moon our tobacco ceremonies, the way we use sage, and their clan system, how people marry in and out of clans, and the rules about paying things back. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I doing 
doing this to these people? I started to see how we were changing their clan system, their council system that's been there for thousands of years. I started to see how opposing democracy means it's not democracy anymore. And I began to think this war is a genocide. If it wasn't, we'd have things in place to help the women, to help the children, to help the civilians. But we don't care about them. We'd rather they die. Die!
There's a talk back after the show. We've widened the debate from the military to domestic and sexual violence. So I do hope you can stay for the talk back. I'd like to say hi to everybody. Uh, this show is being live streamed. And I'd like to say hi to everybody who's watching it all over the world. Thank you very much. and look forward to hearing from you after the show. I didn't want to get, a, you know, get excited, and you never knew if you were going to get extended, and I didn't want to be disappointed. But then the day finally came. I was going home. Sitting on the plane next to Stephen, I was so nervous. I, I didn't know how my family was going to act or how I was going to cope with being a civilian. And I didn't know what was going to happen with Stephen either. You know what every girl hates in the army? is you meet a guy and you get close, but you never really know what kind of guy he's going to be on the outside. Because people can present themselves however they want over there. I got this friend who was so in love with her boyfriend in Iraq that when they got home, she took a plane to go visit him. She waited at the airport for him to pick her up. He never came. You know, when I got to the airport and I was walking through, there was nobody there saying welcome back or nothing. I was disappointed. Because you always see on the news, when people come home, there's all like fireworks and all this, but nope, nothing. Just me, walking through the airport, carrying my bags. I didn't even believe that I was back from Iraq until I saw my grandpa and my aunt. My aunt gave me a hug. Now, I never cry, ever. <laughs> Only when Grammy died, but I, I cried. Because <laughs> coming home is hard. It's like you're a ghost. Like you died and you're coming back to life. And you've got to weasel your way back in because everyone has had to adjust without you. And I, did, I didn't come back the same person. I'm not as easygoing. I don't like being around a lot of people. I can't stand loud noise. And I lost how to dance. I think I'm so in tune with marching that I gotta be really drunk to dance. <laughs> and I started getting really depressed. And that's never happened to me before. I've always been able to deal with things, but I think it was, you know, the army and, and Grammy and losing the baby and being in Iraq. It just all got too much. And it made me really angry the way that I was being treated as a female veteran. We don't get the same respect as men. We have to really fight for it. I have stopped telling people about being shot at and seeing death because I know they don't believe me. They just assume that I did office work. So 
So I, I moved east to be with Steven and to go to school and to get away from my family. And then I got pregnant again. Steven's a sweet guy. But he's different than before. He's from the hood. He's got whoever he had before he had me. I don't know if he has them now. So I guess I'm raising this baby by myself. Whatever. You know, to this day, I've never spoken to my family about my time in Iraq. When they ask me, and I just go, oh, it was hot. I don't want to tell them anything. Because I don't want to feel sorry for myself. And the people close to you, they never understand. And you can't hate them for not understanding. But a lot of the times you do. If you ask the majority of soldiers, do you know what our purpose is in Iraq? They couldn't tell you. Some might give you some political bullshit to justify it, or say that because we wear the uniform, we're supposed to not speak bad about it, but most soldiers would say that they don't see the point. See this area right here? If you think about it as the place the military built for us soldiers, you got toilets and running water, showers, you got trailers with beds and mattresses, air conditioning, washers and dryers, you know, big generators running all night. You got Taco Bells, Subways, PXs, good food, lobster, shrimp, steak, and we're not paying the Iraqis any property taxes or anything at all for all our luxuries. But over here on the outskirts, you got Iraqi families living in huts, no electricity, who are starving. And you tell us when we go outside these gates and there's a kid on the side of the road asking for water, we're not supposed to give it to them? We've got warehouses full of water. But I can't give one bottle of this kid out here who don't have any because we bomb the shit out of their water supply and everything else too. The U.S. government isn't going to stand for anyone coming in and telling us how to run things like that. But we think it's fine to go over there, westernize them. These people have been living this way for centuries. I may not agree with it, but that's their country. And who's to say that our way is the right way? You know what we are? We're just bullies. Bullies. That's what we are. When I got home from Iraq, I, um, <clears throat> I kept everything to myself. I thought I was going to be okay. I jumped straight back into school. I worked hard. Um, but by a year later, I was tense all the time. I was snippy to my friends, hostile. So I stopped hanging out. I did homework for hours every night. And I got jumpy. I couldn't stand loud noises, people walking behind me. I wasn't sleeping well either. But I didn't get any help because I thought my problem was hormones or something. Girl things. Maybe that's because those post-traumatic stress videos they show you never represent women. I don't act like a guy who has PTSD. I don't get into a car, drive 80 miles an hour, punch things! So, I didn't recognize that there was anything wrong until my boyfriend said, you should get some help. So I did. Some people asked me what the best part of being in the army was for me. Is it the drive that I have to succeed now or all the friendships that I made? I can't think of, of a best part. Every day there was a bad day. By the time I got home in April 2004, <clears throat> after 11 months in Iraq, I was really a mess. I couldn't sleep for more than 50 minutes at a time, and I'd be awake for two hours in between. 
I got angry easily, and agitated. I had nightmares about the mortar attacks. Flashbacks. On New Year's Eve, they had fireworks in our town square, and as soon as I heard the booms, I fell to my knees. Every time I opened my eyes, the faces in front of me would fade away, and I'd be brought to that night we were attacked. I was crying hysterically. My friends didn't know what to do, and I had nothing to talk about. All my friends' conversations were about movies I hadn't seen or fashion I didn't know about. Anything I talked about turned morbid very quick. Little kids in Iraq, death, mortar attacks. Then everyone would get quiet and no one would know what to say. I remember this girl talking about how she wanted some designer purse and I said, yeah, I know what you mean. One time in Iraq, these kids wanted some food and I felt really bad because we didn't have enough to give him. I hate it when you can't get what you want. Everyone just sat there. They felt like assholes. I felt like an asshole. I, I was so out of place after I got home. I couldn't feel comfortable in my skin, and I couldn't talk about it to anyone. I didn't know other vets were going through the same thing, so I thought I was crazy. My back and head were injured, too. I'm 80% disabled now because my back's so messed up from banging around in the Humvee, no shock absorbers, hitting my head on the ceiling, compressing my spine. And I couldn't stop worrying about that guy in the mortar attack, Sergeant Hill, and whether he'd lost his arm and could I have done something more. I tried to get a medical discharge from the Army to pay for my benefits, but they made it so difficult, I gave up. I couldn't get the tuition they promised me for a long time either. For a long time, I, I couldn't even get to a clinic for my medication or therapy because all the VA clinics were so far away. I work with veterans now. So I know a lot of soldiers go through this, which helps. It's important for vets to reach out to each other so you don't feel alone and crazy like I did. Um, I still think a lot about why we went to war. Was Saddam a bad person who needed to be removed from power? Yes. Was he the reason for us going in there? Not really. And it's not the guys sitting in their air-conditioned offices at the <coughs> Pentagon who are feeling the aftermath of it. It's the mother and father who are getting their child sent home in a box. It's the innocent people of Iraq who've been killed and raped and had their villages turned upside down. I really do love some of those people of Iraq. But I don't know how to help them. Some of those kids were so beautiful. They only wanted attention and food. Still, I knew if I had to kill a kid to save my buddies, I would. How can anybody love anyone who has such horrible thoughts? When I came home from Afghanistan, I didn't talk to anyone about the rape. Felt it was all my own fault. Took me six months to even tell my mother why I had to leave the Air Force. Why I could never go back. Military has a way of making females believe they brought this upon themselves. Yes, I made some bad decisions. But the guilt lies with the predator, not me. There's an unwritten code of silence when it comes to sexual assault in the military. But if this happened to me and nobody knew about it, I just know it's happening to other females as well. It makes me so mad when I think about the fact that I let them get to me and left the military. I was so proud of being third generation. I had dreams of becoming a high-ranking officer one day like my father and my grandfather. Now, those dreams will never. By the time I came home, I felt like I messed everything up. I let my mom and dad down. I let everyone down. I hated myself. September 30th, 2006. That was the day it was all going to end. 
No more shame would be brought to my family. It would be over. Take the tip of a blade to the middle of your forearm. Touch the top of the main vein. Press the honed steel through your skin. Drag it down so there's no room for mistakes. One shot, one kill. That's what they teach in the army. See the thick blood running bright red? For a moment it seemed that that gash would bring relief. I was ready to cut the other arm when the phone rang. It was Mama. She felt God pushing her to call. She wanted to tell me how proud of me she was. to Iraq, I used to hold healing ceremonies for women. But when I got back, I couldn't deal with those women anymore. But to me, everything they talked about was <clears throat> petty. I didn't want to hear it. I lost connection to my mother, brothers, my sons, my boyfriend, everybody. I came back so angry, and I didn't know why. Nobody could stand me. I couldn't stand myself. It's really hard to admit you have PTSD. It feels weak, because the military teaches you to suck it up and drive on. After I'd been home for a while, my former husband, George, died. He raped me and beat me up. But I went to his funeral anyway. Maybe just to make sure he was dead. Mm. But there was another part of me that cried. Not because he was my husband, but because he was a Vietnam vet who got lost. He didn't come back from war the same. He always talked about raping girls in Vietnam. So what he did to me wasn't any different from what he was used to. So whose fault is it? I don't know. But I don't think he was born that kind of person. I think the military made him like that, and I gave him. After all, I have two sons. After I'd been home from Iraq for about half a year, I wouldn't even dress up, wouldn't wear makeup, didn't care, couldn't concentrate, couldn't sleep, couldn't work. And I became paranoid, thinking people were following me and breaking into my house. And I was afraid to take sleeping pills, because I thought that would make me vulnerable if somebody attacked me. And I was broke. I joined the army to get off welfare. And after 22 years in the military, here I was, on welfare, again. I'm not the only soldier going through this. My friend who I'd served with in Iraq came home a year ago. They found her dead in her home. She'd been dead for two days. PTSD and depression so bad that she couldn't tell anyone because there was nobody to tell. So she killed herself. The war isn't over when you come home. 
One thing I really can't stand is for people to come and say, Thank, thank you for, for your service. service. I hate that. Are you thanking me for participating in a genocide? Is that what you want? Because I'm not protecting anybody's country. I am taking somebody's. Even though I never pulled the trigger, I feel that I participated in a genocide. I feel very responsible, and that's a hard thing to live with. Everything we've done in Iraq is a lie. And I feel very ashamed that I didn't see it sooner, stand up against it. I was a drill sergeant. My job was to teach other people's children how to kill. People ask me, how could I as a spiritual person teach people to kill? How, as a mother, could I send my own sons to war? I asked myself that. I bought into the whole thing. I thought it was the honorable thing to do. I can only hope my ancestors will forgive me. Or that I'll be able to forgive myself. Myself. Uh, and see what the situation is in, in the UK. So I'm going to start off with one of the questions is um, uh, asked Susan, what's the prevalence of sexual assault and rape in the civilian population? Um, well, according to the British Crime Survey here in, um, in Britain, about 80,000 women raped a year, and maybe 30% of the population lifetime will experience sexual assault, half women and men. Right. One of the things that came out of the uh, play is that it's an American play, and women represent 17% of the, uh, the US military, and 90% of the women are sexually harassed. Uh, that, that's the statistic that, that's come out. Um, and one in three uh, uh, will uh, experience a rape or sexual assault of some form or another, so it's one in three, it's quite high. In the English army, um, or the British army, sorry, I apologize for that. The British army, uh, the statistics are, there's 10% of, 10% uh, are women. And we don't have very good statistics in, um, in, uh, in England and Wales regarding uh, uh, rape. And so therefore, 
Liberty, who we're uh, supporting during this uh, play, because of the statistics, we can't the, the, the army can't respond to the problem if they don't know the extent of the problem. Um, the question I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Vera Gray is, when these women are sexually assaulted or raped, where can they go? Where can they get help in, in the civilian world? Um, from, so I'm from an organisation called Rape Crisis, which I don't know if everyone knows about. There's about 40 rape crisis centres um, across England and Wales. There's four here in London. Um, and that would be the main place I would say to go to. So rape crisis centres, they all offer something different, um, but generally it's counselling, advocacy um, for women and girls who are going through the criminal justice process, which if any of you read the media, you know how difficult that process is. We've got a 6% conviction rate uh, in this country, which is just abysmal. Um, so advocacy helps someone go through that process. Also doing outreach work, particularly with homeless women um, who are at great risk of sexual violence. Um, and also prevention and training work um, in schools, uh, with GPs, um, uh, just kind of everywhere that you possibly can to help increase someone's uh, knowledge and awareness about sexual violence. Uh, Dr. Virga, one of the things I read, it, are rape crisis centres closing down? Is there a problem? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a problem. <laughs> I know, just, it's, it's a question because, you know, is it funding or, you yeah, know? Yeah, it's funding. So ongoing, we're always dependent on funding. Anyone that um, knows anything about the charity sector, we're very dependent on funding. So with this recent election, we're all looking very much to see what's going to go on in terms of funding for the charity sector. So they do the best work. I'm not just saying that because um, I'm from one. It is the most specialist work that you can get. You can't get that work from paying for it, you actually can get it provided for free. So I would like to think that we're at a stage now where the government and public understand the value um, of specialist centres like that, but always we need support from the public um, and just watch this space in terms of what happens. Now. So what I'd like to say is if you'd like to support rape crisis, do go on their website and donate, because it's really important this work continues. And uh, one of the other things is the women involved, they've got somewhere to go, but we're also looking at the medical practitioners, the people that deal with the um, w with these women that have got the problems. And uh, um, Professor Susan Bewley's written a book called The ABC of uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence. If you could tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's, it's really important because one of the th issues is that, uh, that's come from the play is that these f women feel very alone. They don't know where to go, they don't know what to do. And in, in civilian society, we're looking at this, and, and one of this is the important thing is that the doctors or the practitioners that you know, have to deal with them, how do they handle it sensitively and everything. So if you'd like to expand on that, that would um, be lovely. Well, in, in addition to the rape crisis centres, there are all around the country there are sexual assault referral centres uh, funded by the police so that in, if a woman uh, or a child or a man um, is raped or sexually assaulted, there's a place to go for immediate care, usually through the police, but it can be through self-referrals. Maybe only 10% of people report immediately and get immediate care Partly it's some forensic work for the police and criminal justice, but also the immediate care in terms of uh, being kind, uh, appreciative of what someone's gone through, and sorting out emergency contraception, sexually transmitted infections, and ongoing counselling. Because it, as, as we saw here, very high rates of mental distress afterwards, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, etc. So there's an immediate set of um, needs, both criminal justice and medical, and then, obviously, uh, in all parts of medicine, we meet people who've had bad experiences in childhood. Uh, we're seeing a lot of historical child abuse being reported now. And, 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 and it can appear in all sorts of parts of the body and systems, and in mental health services in particular. But the reason um, our editor's book with a, a colleague who set up the, the Havens, that's the London Sex Assault Referral Centre, is because we want everyone in the NHS to be able to support somebody who says something very bad happened to me. It might be sexual violence, it might be physical violence, it might be controlling behaviours, it might be terrible things that happen to children, and actually know how to hold it and, and where to go next. How to, how to be kind, how to be supportive, how to document, how to witness just being with someone kindly, and then go into the very specialist services of which there are all sorts for FGM, for honor based violence, uh, domestic violence. Lots and lots of different kinds of problems which have health impacts, but you know, these are social problems, not so. What are the really long term health. needs of these women that have been sexually assaulted? You know, what, what, how can society help these women? 
you know, in a short-term basis, they can get to these assault centres, they can be referred on to specialists, but the longer to, like some of these le women who come back from war, you know, highlight these issues. Uh, Short-term, you know, they deal with it, you know, they may tell a friend, but long-term, what are the mental health needs? What, what does society need to do in order to support these women? Um, well, I think the first thing, the first thing is because we know most, many people don't tell anyone at all, and many people will tell a friend. Actually, I think a lot of the um, hurt and upset and repeated upset comes from uh, rape myths, media stories, mm -hmm. disbelief. And those are things that collectively we have to do something about. In terms of specifics, I mean, some women will need help with housing because they'll be need to get away from a violent partner. 50% of, 40, 50% of people in domestic violence relationships are raped by their intimate partners. So sometimes people will need help with housing, sometimes people will need help with immigration. In terms of health, um, it's largely in primary care and general practice. We've got some general practitioners here um, who, will, who, who I know here will know better. And, and I, I'm not a psychiatrist or right. psychology, but yeah. there, there, are, um, there are a number of you know, very effective uh, talking therapies, um, treatments for post-traumatic stress. You know, it's not all pharmacological okay. support that people right. need. Um, I was just going to ask Dr. Uh, Vera Gray um, regarding how do you think we can prevent sexual violence and domestic violence? I mean, it's one of the important things, you know, if we've got a problem, but how can we, before we have the problem, how can we prevent it? Mm, I think it's a really good point. It's something that we um, very deeply believe in, and everyone needs to believe it, is that it's not inevitable. The fact, like you were saying earlier, that we're, we're living in a place where there's 80,000 women a year are being raped, 400,000 women a year experiencing some form of sexual assault. And it gets into a mindset that it's inevitable and that we can't do anything about it. And we need to not believe that. We need to understand that this is a social problem, it has a social cause. And so therefore we can do something about it. Very much around challenging the rape myths, challenging the media. Um, and something that we are very big on is trying to get um, proper sex education into schools in this country, which again, after the election, is probably not gonna happen. So hopefully you'll see in the media a much bigger, more vocal <coughs> campaign um, about that because what we're seeing, the other thing that we're seeing on the side of it, which we were talking about a bit before, is then growing numbers of sexual assaults happening within institutions such as universities because we've got young people in schools who are not being told anything about what consent is, they're being bombarded with messages from the media, from pornography, um, from kind of vast forms of sexualization of culture. No one's talking to them about what consent is, what consent means. Um, and then they're growing up in that world, they're going on, they're going into university and we're seeing the rates of sexual assault and rape happening in university increase. And similar to some of the um, issues that were raised in the play um, around when disclosures of sexual violence are made at universities, the response from the authorities um, are very bad, very silencing, very much you have the problem as the person who's being raped, uh, not the perpetrator. So yeah, sex education, challenging myths and holding events like this I think is really important for all of you coming to events like this, like actually taking some time to learn the issues, to think around the issues. It was a very difficult play to watch, but it has such an emotional impact. And to take that impact then back to the world, talk to people about it, talk to friends about it. Um, and I think if there's enough of us working together against it, we can actually prevent it. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the debate up to, um, to all of you. Has anybody got any questions at all? Anybody? Total quietness. <laughs> I'm going to have a look to see if anybody's... Oh, have you? Okay, lovely. Thank you. How much a part do you think that self-esteem plays in terms of sexual violence with you know, young women in particular? In terms of the impact of sexual violence, do you mean? Or? Yeah, or you know, the issues around non-consensual sexual activity and things, how much of a part do you think that that plays? Obviously, it's going to be different for everybody. Do you think that it's quite significant? Yeah, I think that what, what happens a lot of the time that we never really think about is the way that perpetrators target um, particular women and girls. And I think they will target women and girls that they know um, don't feel very good about themselves. And they will do that, you were saying earlier, around domestic violence relationships and what we know is one of the first strategies that they will use is to make the person feel very good about themselves. You're very good, you're very beautiful, you're very special. I think you're more special than your friends do. Slowly start to isolate you. Um, then the controlling behaviour increases and then we see physical and sexual assault. So I think um, it's very important to see the way that perpetrators use um, a whole host of things that we all have um, in order to facilitate a space where they can... Okay. 
And, and certainly, um, I haven't been um, doing the sex defences work for very long, but very struck by um, how vulnerabilities play out, how women who, young, young girls are, are, are targeted, uh, seen quite a number of women with disabilities of one sort or another, uh, women, uh, young women with uh, mental health problems, and certainly we know that um, children who've, who've experienced uh, breaching of boundaries, whether that's sexual or um, uh, violence as children, or having very dis dis disruptive, dysfunctional, chaotic families, that actually they, that those boundaries are, aren't so clear. So that, again, I think people can pick, you know, that's, that's somebody who may not stand up for themselves in the same kind of a way. And you, you, you see that playing out in the, in, in the women who are coming through reporting to the you had a question? I was wondering what do you think um, men are being, men and boys are being involved in the right way um, in terms of I don't know, certain campaigns, um, whether, whether enough emphasis is being put on the fact that they can be involved in um, education, sexual education and the, the treatment of women. Yeah, I think that they're not being involved enough, definitely. There's um, great work that is going to start to be done, I hope, here around bystander Work. I don't know if anyone knows about bystander, but it's about talking about in, with sexual violence, you've got a potential victim, potential perpetrator, but then you've also got the third person mm. who are, you know, all of us who are people that see things where they think, I'm not sure if that's entirely right, you know, and it's about involving men and boys in that because as a man, I'm not a man, but if I was a man, um, it's not very nice to be totally always talked to as though you're a potential perpetrator. You need to also be talked to um, as though you're a potential kind of change agent. Um, which is someone who can intervene and we do work in uh, schools and what we definitely see is that the young boys really respond We bring in young male trainers with us and they really respond to um, Those young men so it's about skilling up young men to talk to other men to challenge other men about some of their behaviors and attitudes towards women Yeah, I had a question. Sorry, did, were you going to go on to that? Because mine's sort of linked to that and I was uh, just curious because you talked about sex education in schools and sort of ramping that up when I was in secondary school, early, early in my secondary education, I was like 11 or 12, and we had PSE, which was personal social education, and that was everything. And it was run by this, a man who had PTSD himself that was undiagnosed, most definitely. He'd been in the Marines for like 25 years, and he was brutal. He was a terrible bully of some of the most vulnerable people, and he taught sports as well. And here was this man, it was a boys' school. And we were all brutalized by the experience of being taught social education by this guy to some degree or other. I mean, he bullied me frequently in front of people and humiliated me in front of the group. Um, do you think that there's this, especially because I my experience was a boys' school, th there's a lot of new information that I think young men need to absorb about not just sexuality, but also about gender yeah. and gender identity. And like, I didn't receive any of that. And I, I'm 32, but I still feel like I'm just like all the time having my mind blown by having to really Changed some of my attitudes because quite often, like I've worked a bit within the like with the military, and I've seen there's these two responses. This kind of one, you're the gallant, protecting the little woman, putting her at the back of the truck, you know, so that she doesn't get hurt or whatever. Oh, that's parallel to the yeah. plane. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things. You yeah, know, so you're you know. one on the one hand, you're either yeah. the gallant or you're you, you're sort of oh, well, I'm showing you that I I fancy you. So mm -hmm. obviously that that peps up your self-esteem. And as a man, you kind of sometimes think, well, what is it that I'm supposed to do to help this person? Is there a third language that I need to learn to help this person feel empowered in a, in a, in a way that isn't the ways that feel automatic to me based on my previous educational training? You know, so it's like those new skills that I have to learn. You know, I'm, I'm getting into my older adulthood. But these kids, and t you know, these teenage boys really need to get that when they're pubescent. You know, because that, do, do you have, feelings about that, thoughts about how yeah. a new sort of PSE almost, like a new personal social sexual education. That's it, so we're involved in a campaign, There's, um, now it's PSHE, mm -hmm. so right. it's personal social health education, um, but it's not compulsory. And so we're involved in a campaign to try and make it compulsory um, in schools, but it's not at the moment, so schools can pick and choose, faith schools generally don't do it, um, a whole bunch of schools generally don't do it. In some schools you have some really good practice and I think it really makes a difference. But it's, it's just very patchy, so it's about actually saying to the government, you, you're letting kids down, you're letting boys down in this, you're, you're setting them up, um, and, and you're setting up women as well. We need definitely to start talking about gender, 
definitely start talking about um, sexuality in schools because the levels of homophobia that I see in schools is out of this world and it's completely connected um, to that kind of gender order stuff. Do you have anything to say? I was just going to say, for all, whatever the curriculum is, you, there's a hidden curriculum as well because, you know, my daughter's been fantastically well educated, but she says, now they're all 17, the boys, they're all absolutely fabulous gallants, whatever they are. They're, they're you know, really nice, one by one. In a group, they're just a pack, they're rude, they you know, can you make me my sandwich, da 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 da, and you know, mm. everything's sexual talk because that's what the pack wants. Mm. And she, she's just, you know, she's, well, I don't know how you deal with the, you know, what's official and what's actually going on because there's always a disjunct being there. But I think, I mean, I'm quite struck that um, young people have got all sorts of resiliences that. I wasn't aware of, mm. you know, and a lot of them are dealing with, um, you know, sex texts and phone porn and getting, going and sorting themselves out sexually and getting contraception and so forth. And, you know, they're having to negotiate what's fantasy and reality. And I think for the children who are, are not so, uh, haven't got such self-esteem, that's when they, you know, they can be picked on and there are problems. But... I, you know, I'm not unhopeful for our children, um, and I, some of the young medical students I see are so wise about um, gender and behaviours that they see amongst doctors, and they talk about you know this male registrar taking the pee out of this female student was slut shaming. I think the boys do that. <laughs> yeah. you know, how does he know how that? <laughs> so um, I wouldn't. I, I don't want to be despondent. Yeah. I mean, I still think there's a lot of work to do. Well, I'm just going to, um, uh, what was said by um, um, Sir Nick Carter, who's the head of the UK Army, he actually uh, qu quoted that there, there's got to be a cultural shift in order to, um, to um, negotiate this bullying and sexual harassment in the Army. That was quoted on the, we were on the Today programme, which was um, on, on the 19th of May. Uh, please, um, if, you know, hit the link and listen to the rest of the program. But that was one of the things he said. So in order for a cultural shift, you need both, both sexes. You need men and women to realize that there is a problem and to go forward. And on that note, I'm going to close the debate. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the show, for supporting, um, supporting us. I'd like to thank everybody who's watching on the live stream. Hi to all you guys in the States. My Kickstarter backers that backed this play, that allowed it to have a voice because it's a very difficult subject. It deals with women, it deals with sexual violence, it deals with PTSD. It's a multi-layered play and has lots of problems. It deals with the military, it deals with the American military, but there's parallels in um, civilian life as we've discussed tonight. And I'd like to thank our actors who've done an amazing job, our technicians. Um, and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much for coming.